Chapter 3, Part 7 Let us here, however, consider only the investigation of the generative themes or the meaningful thematics. Once the investigators have determined the area in which they will work and have acquired a preliminary acquaintance with the area through secondary sources, they initiate the first stage of the investigation. This beginning, like any beginning in a human activity, involves difficulties and risks which are to a certain point normal, although they are not always evident in the first contact with the individuals of the area. In this first contact, the investigators need to get a significant number of persons to agree to an informal meeting during which they can talk about the objectives of their presence in their area. In this meeting, they explain the reason for the investigation, how it is to be carried out, and to what use it will be put. They further explain that the investigation will be impossible without a relation of mutual understanding and trust. If the participants agree both to the investigation and to the subsequent process, the investigators should call for volunteers among the participants to serve as assistants. These volunteers will gather a series of necessary data about the life of the area. Of even greater importance, however, is the active presence of these volunteers in the investigation. Meanwhile, the investigators begin their own visits to the area, never forcing themselves, but acting as sympathetic observers with an attitude of understanding towards what they see. While it is normal for investigators to come to the area with values which influence their perceptions, this does not mean that they may transform the thematic investigation into a means of imposing these values. The only dimension of these values which is hoped to which it is hoped the people whose thematics are being investigated will come to share, it is presumed that the investigators possess this quality, is a critical perception of the world which implies a correct method of approaching reality in order to unveil it. And critical perception cannot be imposed. Thus, from the very beginning, thematic investigation is expressed as an educational pursuit, as cultural action. During their visits, the investigators set their critical aim on the area under study, as if it were for them an enormous, unique living code to be deciphered. They regard the area as a totality, and visit upon visit attempt to split it by analyzing the partial dimensions which impress them. Through this process, they expand their understanding of how the various parts interact which will later help them penetrate the totality itself. During this decoding stage, the investigators observe certain moments of life of the area, sometimes directly, sometimes by means of informal conversations with the inhabitants. They register everything in their notebooks, including apparently unimportant items, the way the people talk, their style of life, their behavior at church and at work. They record the idiom of the people, their expressions, their vocabulary, and their syntax, not their incorrect pronunciation, but rather the way they construct their thought. It is essential that the investigators observe the area under varying circumstances, labor in the fields, meetings of a local association, noting the behavior of the participants, the language used, and the relations between the officers and the members the role played by women and by young people, leisure hours, games and sports, conversations with people in their homes, noting examples of husband-wife and parent-child relationships. No activity must escape the attention of the investigators during the initial survey of the area. After each observation visit, the investigator should draw up a brief report to be discussed by the entire team. In order to evaluate the preliminary findings of both the professional investigators and the local assistants. To facilitate the participation of the assistants, the evaluation meetings should be held in the area itself. The evaluation meetings represent a second stage in the decoding of the unique living code. As each person in his decoding essay 
relates how he perceived or felt a certain occurrence or situation. His exposition challenges all the other decoders by re representing to them the same reality upon which they have themselves be been intent. At this moment, they reconsider through the considerations of others their own previous consideration. Thus, the analysis of reality made by each individual decoder sends them all back dialogically to this disjoined whole which once more becomes a totality evoking a new analysis by the investigators following which a new evaluative and critical meeting will be held. Representatives of the inhabitants participate in all activity as members of the investigating team. The more the group divide and reintegrate the whole, the more closely they approach the nuclei of the principal and secondary con contradictions which involve the inhabitants of the area. By locating these nuclei of contradictions, the investigators might even at this stage be able to organize the program content of their educational action. Indeed, if the content reflected these contradictions, it would undoubtedly contain the meaningful thematics of the area and one can safely affirm that action based on these observations would be much more likely to succeed than that based on decisions from the top. The investigators should not, however, be tempted by this possibility. The basic thing, starting from the initial perception of these nuclei of contradictions, which include the principal contradiction of society as a larger epochal unit, is to study the inhabitants' level of awareness of these contradictions. Intrinsically, these contradictions constitute limit situations, involve themes, and indicate tasks. If individuals are caught up in and are unable to separate themselves from these limit situations, their theme in reference to these situations is fatalism, and the task implied by the theme is the lack of a task. Thus, although the limit situations are objective realities which call forth needs in individuals, one must investigate with these individuals their level of awareness in these situations. A limit situation as a concrete reality can call forth from persons in different areas, and even in sub-areas of the same area, quite opposite themes and tasks. Thus, the basic concern of the investigators should be to concentrate on the knowledge of what Goldman calls real consciousness and the potential consciousness. Real consciousness is the result of the multiple obstacles and deviations that the different factors of empirical reality put into opposition and submit for realization by the potential consciousness. Real consciousness implies the impossibility of perceiving the untested feasibility which lies beyond the limit situations. But whereas the untested feasibility cannot be achieved at the level of real or present consciousness, it can be realized through testing action, which reveals its hitherto unperceived viability. The untested feasibility and real consciousness are related as our testing action and potential consciousness. Goldman cons Goldman's concept of potential consciousness is similar to what Nikolai terms unperceived practicable solutions. Our untested feasibility, in contrast to perceived practicable solutions and presently practiced solutions, which correspond to Goldman's real consciousness. Accordingly, the fact that the investigators may, in the first stage of the investigation, approximately apprehend the complex of contradictions does not auto authorize them to begin to structure the program content of educational action. This perception of reality is still their own, not that of the people. It is with the apprehension of the complex of contradictions that the second stage of the investigation begins. Always acting as a team, 
The investigators will select some of these contradictions to develop the codifications to be used in the thematic investigation. Since the codifications, sketches, or photographs are the objects which mediate the decoders in their critical analysis, the preparation of these codifications must be guided by certain principles other than the usual ones for making visual aids. End of chapter 3, part 6.